So Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and moving forward. Anyone say moving forward? To those things which are ahead. To those things which are ahead. Now, I like that verse and um, because we've already touched on it from a number of different angles over various weeks, but I want to just remind you that you and I are not to let our past imprison our potential. You know, what lies ahead of you is your potential. Uh, what lies ahead of us in Christ is greater or can be than what lies behind us in, in experience. And one of the things that I, I heard one time when I was kind of uh, dwelling on this is don't let the things that lie behind you lie to you about what lies ahead of you. It's a play of words. Don't let the things that lie behind you, referring to a past experience, lie to you about what's ahead of you or what lies before you. Again, it's a play of words. Oftentimes, because of certain experiences that we've had uh, either imposed upon us or we've stepped into certain emotional relational, whatever it is, landmines, and uh, things didn't always turn out for us. You know, sometimes it leaves marks on us. It could have been in our family upbringing. It could have been choices that we've made. But the beauty of Christ is that he forgives and he empowers us to move forward. This is such an encouraging word for any person on the planet earth that no matter how dark life can get at times the best is still ahead of you in christ not just because there's more days and hours and time frame but it's in christ because paul is talking about moving forward to those things which are ahead but he's making reference to in christ and if you and i trust in christ even with all that is going on even when things sometimes in society and in our culture don't even begin to make sense. How do you move forward through all of that? You're raising a family, you know, you're, you're moving forward in, in the newness of your life in Christ, or maybe you just started a job and a career and all these things are starting to pop up and, you know, well, here's insight I wanna give you. And I'm gonna key off something that I've shared not too long ago. Our second president, John Adams, here in the United States of America, once said, there are two types of education, remember? One teaches you how to make a living, and the other teaches you how to live. And would say how to live. You know, there's a huge difference between making a living and understanding how to live. You can understand how to make a living, but not know how to live. They, 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 they are, and they could be, united. But oftentimes, they're opposed. Because you could be making a living while your family is falling apart and your children are running crazy because you don't know how to live. You, you could uh, be uh, entitled and, uh, and maybe well worth that, en that entitlement that maybe you earned in some educational experience and, and efforts, and that's great. Imagine you've put all your time and effort in making a living, but you don't know how to keep your body together, your mind together, your family together, your children together. You don't have any peace. You're always anxious. You're always worried. You're always on some kind of medication trying to give you some temporary relief. You don't know how to live. Now, I don't say that as a statement of judgment. I make that as a statement is that's not how you have to live life. Certainly, as a believer, that ought not be your scenario. Tell your neighbor and say, I'm going to say amen to that. <laughs> so there's a big difference on how to make a living, and I encourage you. God will open doors for you to make a, a living, but not to the exclusion on how to live, because if you don't know how to live, making a living is not going to amount up to a whole lot. There's a lot of people that have a lot of things that sometimes people that don't have those things say, boy, I wish I had that. Boy, wouldn't I have the life if I had the kind of house they have and lived in the kind of neighborhood they have? You know, somebody still has to mow the lawn. Anyways, um, 
or, you know, this, that, and the other, and, and the list goes on. But we, to get the backstory, you know, to some of these individuals, and I don't wish that on any person, you know, you see the, the other side of their life is not always a pretty thing. But the Bible reveals something to us. It's always good to go to the Word because the Word is not only an anchor for you, but it's a rudder for your life. In James chapter 3, it talks about how your tongue is like the rudder of your life and it will get you through the storms of life. I'm not going to be talking about the tongue, but I'm going to be talking about something else here. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, it says, The just shall live by his faith. So, the just shall live by his faith. Everyone say that out loud. The just shall live by his faith. Not by faith, but by his faith. Now, three other times this verse is referred to in the New Testament. Romans, Galatians. And, uh, and it's important that you and I understand what it says here. The just shall live not by their faith, or that person's faith, but by his own faith. So there's an ability for you and I to live by faith in God. Not faith separate from God, but faith in God. And again, as I said, I want to just kind of give you a little foundation before I, I jump into something. It's to live by faith in his word because you cannot separate the character of God from the word that God spoke. Right? can't separate God and his word, can't separate the author from what he scripted and what he spoke. And it's important that you and I understand this. So as some of you have been versed, just to quickly mention to you, it's impossible to please God without faith. So pleasing God is to walk by faith. To walk by faith simply means to trust him. Well, how do I trust him? Well, you cannot possibly trust God if you don't trust what he says. Uh, and it's the most basic, and I don't want to go too long because it'll take me off track and use up my time, but imagine he says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, make all your requests known unto God, Philippians 4, 6, and the God of peace, and God shall give you peace over your mind and over your heart. That's his promise. But you have to step into it and believe it and act. Amen? You, you have to receive that because he is the God of peace. And he says, if you'll pray to me, cast your cares over on me, I will give you a peace, you know, that you can live out in the midst of a storm. I mean, you know, you can have peace in the middle of a storm. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, come on. And the Bible says in Romans 14, 23, and whatever is not of faith is sin. Meaning everything that is not a faith towards God is carnal, is natural, and is not going to be productive. Every Christian is required to live by faith, to fight the good fight of faith, and to conquer life's circumstances and challenges by faith. I mean, every one of us, what do you call it? You have to get down and dirty. You have to, you have to begin at some point in your life to apply the word and what it says, what he says. And, and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. You know, the Bible says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover me with His feathers and under His wings shall I take refuge. His truth shall be my shield and my buckler. And it goes on and goes on and goes on. Psalms 91. You ought to read that every day of your life. Amen? Because it talks about how his truth shall be your shield and buckler. And I bring that up to your attention because God has proven time and time and time again. He doesn't look for community agreement. Rather, he looks for that one man, that one woman, that couple that are in agreement. That's what I love about married couples. And again, congratulations on Seth and Autumn. They just renewed their, their vows. And had a great day. We weren't able to be there. We were in New Zealand, but, but uh, I think Branson did the, uh, did, uh, yeah, and it was great. Couldn't have got to sing. Thank goodness he didn't have me singing because 
would have ruined everything. Anyways, uh, but the point is we're, we're really excited because when a person gets married, it's not just two people, two independent people kind of living out their independent ways, kind of joined together at the hip because they have, you know, uh, somewhat of a desire. They want family. They want whatever, more income coming. And my gosh, that is such a carnal way. of a, That's not even the, God's way of marriage. Bible says when you're married, you become heirs together in the grace of life. Heirs together. Heirs juntos. Say juntos. See, you learn Spanish, the language of heaven. Amen. Okay, so the email is still out. We come heirs together in the grace of life. In other words, we both, when you walk by faith, when we live by faith, we're, we're, it's faith in the grace of God and what he's done in that which we did not deserve. It's, it's faith in his salvation and his what his word says when it comes to forgiving us. What his word says when it comes to his mercy. What his word says when it comes to our frailty and his strength. What his word says on any and every subject is having faith in that and trusting and believing that beyond what you feel like. Because sometimes we just feel miserable. Sometimes we just feel like we're a pile of junk, you know, emotionally speaking. You know, sometimes we feel like we're just not all that in a bag of chips, you know. And yet his word says according to his word, that we're more than conquerors, amen, that we can overcome, and that he loves us, and that he cares for us, and that he lives inside of us, and it takes faith to believe that, my friends, it takes a trust beyond how you feel, your trusting in your feelings is not faith in God, you don't try to feel your way through life, you have to learn how to use your faith in him and what he has said, because he has not lied to you. And if you're the only person on this planet, just imagine with all the myriad of people, wonderful people, goofy people, flaky people, and in-between people, whoever they are, okay? But if you will be the one that says, I'm going to believe God, you know, according to his word, um, according to his salvation. That's why this verse has become such an anchor for decades in my life. What if some do not believe, Romans chapter 3, verse 3 says. What if some do not believe and are without faith? Does their lack of faith and their faithlessness nullify and make ineffective and void the faithfulness of God and the loyalty that he has to his word? No, verse 4 says. No, let God be true and every man a liar. I can even lie to myself. Every man a liar is not just other people. It could be me. I'm a man. If you haven't noticed, I am. I could end up lying to myself. I could say, oh, you know, I don't feel like I'm more than a conqueror. I don't feel like I'm going to go anywhere. I don't feel like I'm going to do anything. You know, you might be saying that because of how you feel. But if you're a believer, that's not true. You're lying to yourself. This is why what we need to do is to renew our minds to God's word. So we would know what his perfect will is for our lives. And that's what's called living by faith. Now, there is a bigger picture of the good fight of faith that you and I need to understand. Yes, your faith is learning how to use your faith for yourself, for your family, for your needs. But faith in God is much, much greater than just self-service. And I don't mean that in a wrong way. It's very important that you and I learn to have faith for the healing of our bodies, the peace of our mind, and uh, the things that are within the, the context of our personal life. But Paul said, you know, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. Notice he says, I've kept the faith. Well, if it was automatically always going to be part of his life, why did he have to make an effort to keep it? Well, because in another verse, of course, but here also, he says, I have fought the good fight. He's referring to the good fight of faith. See, having faith in a moment and keeping it for a lifetime is your decision. In fact, it was Paul who wrote to Timothy, and he says, some having rejected, this is 1 Timothy 1.19, some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. It's another thing to have a bad day. It's another thing to have a shipwreck. 
you know, it's one thing to have a fender bender. It's another thing to pile it up. And in this particular case, he's talking about two individuals that cast their faith away for whatever reasons. Maybe they got caught up in the narratives of the day. Can we go there? Well, we will. And so the Bible also refers to, real quick, you know, that the weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful in 2 Corinthians 10 for the destroying of sophisticated arguments that are contrary to the truth. I'm referring to God's truth. You have to guard your mind. You have to guard your heart. Because you're in the middle of a battle that many of you don't even realize you're the target. And um, an open war is currently blatantly and aggressively upon us. It's a cultural war. I'm sure you've heard, if you have any kind of level of social media, bits and pieces, however depth you are, that's that's out of your interest. But, and like I say, you're in the middle of it. In fact, I would say you're a target. It's real, it's tangible, it's every day, it's unrelenting, it's devilish, it is spiritual, and it's ever present. Give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Take a look at this. I believe it's God's mercy that he is showing us how bad things can get to wake up those of us who can still be awakened before it's too late. As you take God out, what is replaced mm -hmm. is satanic. There's no neutral. We've been fooled into thinking, well, we're neutral. Secular is neutral. Uh, in my other book, Is Atheism Dead?, I actually look at atheism and you realize atheism, you know, or secularism pretends to be neutral. <laughs> but if you really look at it, you cannot be neutral. Critical race theory is founded on uh, its cultural Marxism. It's absolutely. And, and it's total gobbledygook and it's ultimately racist. It has no basis even on which to say race is wrong. So we're living in a time where we need to know what we believe and we need to live out our faith. And we need to tell people the truth that apart from the God of the Bible, we don't have the possibility of freedom. We don't have the possibility of eradicating racism or any bad thing. And so the, the church, rather than be bold, we've kind of, as I say, we've retreated and retreated. And we've been silent in the face of evil because we bought the lie. There's a chapter in the book, Be Ye Not Political. Like we bought even the lie that like, well, we're not supposed to be political. And you think, where does that come? That's not even a biblical idea. What are you talking about? If slavery is on the docket and you're voting, would you say, look, well, I don't want to take a, I don't, from my pulpit, I don't want to lose my 501c3 status, so I'm not going to take a, <laughs> a position on slavery. If you don't take a position on slavery, you're a pig. How, what kind of Christian would you be if yeah. you would not say that is evil from the pit of hell? Right. And it was Christians who led the battle That's right. for abolition of the slave trade who led the battle of abolition of slavery. It was Christians who led all those battles because they knew from the word of God, this is wrong. And we're, we're living in a time when, when, when people don't want to talk about that. And they, they want to say, well, we, we, we don't think you should be political in churches. Listen, folks, if we don't live out our faith in every sphere, including the political, satanic values replace it. Yeah. And that is what is happening now because of the silence of the church. And so I wrote this book hoping to reach those who might still be reached because it is only when the church lives out its faith and understands that it is our duty before God to live out our faith in every single sphere and to push back yes. hard against the evil that is all around us, against the bad ideas that are all around us. Why do we push back? We push back because God commands us to love our neighbor. And if you love your neighbor, you will advocate for the truth. You will speak out against the transgender madness because lives are being destroyed and God holds you responsible as the church. You need to speak up against that. That's there are right. parents that they don't know what to think, they don't know what to do. The church needs to be a strong voice. I mean, I thought of this earlier this morning. What could be possibly clearer than he made us male and female in his image? image. There's nothing more basic than that. Nothing more basic than that. You know, it's interesting um, because we live in a, in a world 
where either the culture will influence you or you will become an influence towards the culture in, in the most godly sense. And I think sometimes Christians think that we're just here to exist. But we're here to influence. As God told Jeremiah one time, he was complaining in Jeremiah 15 in the Living Bible, look it up sometime. He was complaining, you know, for all the evil that was going on. And once that God said to him, you know, stop this nonsense, he says. You are here to influence them, not them influence you. Yes, they're going to attack you. Yes, they're going to come up against you, but I will be your defender. You ought to read it sometime. It's really good. But it's important that, that you understand that we live in a culture that is trying to, think about it, at least consider this, church, to swallow your confidence without you knowing it. Take your security, your assurance, and certainly steal your voice, trying to get you to pressure you that you don't have a right to speak concerning what we're saying. It takes discernment to not be swept up in the mob rule kind of popular faddish way of platitudes that are being you know, thrown out in a very cavalier way at this juncture in our society. In fact, what Paul says in Romans 12 too, don't be so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Notice the difference. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. I like what it says in, in another translation. It says, stop imitating the ideals and the opinions of the culture around you, but inwardly, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. So only, only Jesus Christ, God's word, and the work of the Holy Spirit can give you the kind of power to change you from the inside out. To change you inwardly or to inwardly transform you as it says here. Or to give you the power to discern. I mean, I, mean, I know we're knowledgeable people, educated in so many ways. And, and that's good. But it doesn't mean you have discernment. It's what I call learning to read between the lines. You have to learn to not just hear what you're hearing, but hear what's being said between what's the motive, what's rooted in all that. And um, this is what gives you what Paul says here, the beautiful life in Christ. See, the adversary has attempted to pressure the church, causing many Christians to end up being double-minded about their positions and about their confidence unsure and silent about what they should be confident about, and that is truth, God's truth. I don't understand, unless you're a young Christian, why you're not, why a Christian would be so unsettled about the author of truth and what he said. See, truth is not just for educational purposes. It's to understand how you were designed by the creator that's way beyond your capacity to even comprehend, let alone his love, his meticulous way of putting you together before your mother and father even knew what you were to be. He says, I already formed you and had a plan for you. Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Not just any kind of knowledge. They have rejected my truth. 
There are many people in this world, and behind the, the, the arguments, the narratives that a world will, will, will front you with, whether it's in our higher educational or uh, environments or in the workforce's um, environments or wherever it might be, what's rooted behind that? You need to understand what's rooted behind We don't fight against flesh and blood, but there is a fight. And sometimes the fight is not being aggressive, but it's taking your stand and not bowing your knee. But you need to understand there's not two sides to truth. And, um, but people don't realize when you see the truth is what will make you free, Jesus said. You shall know the truth, and truth will make you free. His truth is not like a mystery. His word is not like a mystery. How we should love, how we should treat people, mercy. Now watch. The adversary will come in and give you a little bit of truth to pervert and twist things his way. That's why you need this word called discernment. Say discernment. Very important. Many of you are discerning already. You're discerning. You can tell when a person's trying to play you with his words. Right? Oh, I got a deal for you, man. Just give me this kind of money. And then, hey. He's like, ooh, you're playing me, aren't you? No, bro, I ain't playing you. Anyways, but Isaiah 15, 5, sorry. Isaiah 5, 13 says, Therefore my people, notice who he said, my people have gone into captivity, imprisonment, lockdown, because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished. And their multitude dried up with thirst. When you don't know the truth about marriage, it will dry up. When you don't know the truth about your health, it will dry up. When you don't know the truth about emotions, your emotions will dry you up. I mean, not dry, but I mean, this is where you're out of control. When you don't know the truth about relationships and interpersonal relationships and how that works, that will dry up. In other words, drying up doesn't mean that it just goes dry. It just means that it doesn't work out obviously. But imagine being an honorable man, an honorable woman, and yet famished because you got the title, you just don't have the wisdom. You got the title, but you don't have the discernment. And we're not just talking about any kind of knowledge. We're talking about truth. Say truth. And there is a battle for truth. And um, therefore, I remind you of a passage from Jude. Jude is speaking to um, the church and he says, dearly loved friend, he says, I was fully intending to write to you about our amazing salvation we all participate in, but felt you need instead, I felt, I'm sorry, but felt the need instead to challenge you to vigorously defend and contend for the beliefs, the truths that we cherish. For God through your for God through the apostles has once for all entrusted these truths to his holy believers. He's not talking about just uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers or what's referred to as the fivefold ministry. He's talking about the body, Christ. If you're a believer, you're called, he's referring to you as a holy believer. But he's entrusted these truths to you and your generation. That you would pass it on and have an influence and be the influence of truth. Godly righteous truth that always brings health, healing, and wholeness, salvation to people. Always benefits. There's nothing that Jesus ever did that did not benefit humanity. Often times people didn't want to be benefited by him. That's their choice. But let me add a little bit more to this scenario. I go on and... From Jude chapter 1, I go, it's only one chapter. I go in verse 5. Let's just listen to the wording it says here. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in the everlasting chains under the darkness of judgment, of that great day. He's talking about one third of the angels that follow Lucifer. Verse 7. 
And Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Verse 8. This is our loving Jesus now, okay? Verse 8. Likewise also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Verse 10. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. Verse 12. These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear. That word fear means reverence. There's no regard, no honor, no reverence. Serving only themselves. Those are called parasite friends. Okay, so let me continue. They are clouds without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit um, with wherewith, without fruit, sorry, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. Most people think there is no judgment. This just keep it happy. Throw me some more sugar. There's plenty of it in the Bible. Plenty of, plenty of, but when it comes to meddling with truth that affects people's lives, God takes it very serious. And um, so he's just laying it out. He's just laying it out. He says, I am the God of love. I am the God of forgiveness. I am the God of compassion. I am the God of mercy. I am the God of grace. I am all that. And more that you can never, ever in the wildest and the greatest of depth of your imagination could ever comprehend one iota of the kind of love I have for you. But the God of love is still a God of righteousness. So who are these people? Well, here we go. Hold on to your seatbelts. I hope you can make it. They are manifested as what we would refer to today as woke ideology. Today there are people that are bought into what's, what I refer to as woke Christians and woke churches. They are simply what 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 to 4 in your own time you can read. That go after another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. It didn't just start in the 21st century, my friends didn't just start with the narratives that you and I are hearing today. It's always been because it's demonic and at the root of it all, it's only coming up now because we have more social media and we see a lot more exposed, you know, quickly, readily, I mean, on our doorstep. We don't even have to wait for any, any time you want. You can tap into this kind of um, news feed from any. But to give you an idea of... Uh, a little bit more of what I'm talking about before I go into a little bit of the definition of this. Take a look at this. I think we, we've lost our sense of shame and, and anything goes. You, you kind of think, what would somebody have to do to get, Chris, let's just say Christians, but I would say any American, to say, I, I'm never going to go to that store again, ever. They have crossed the line. Now, they crossed that line 10 years ago. But now, it is so unbelievably, clearly wicked and sick. I'm talking about the Dodgers. I'm talking about Target. I'm talking about Disney. If you do not let them know that they must pay a price. Now, because here's the point. If you do not put the Dodgers and Target and Disney out of business or hurt them very, very badly for, for the just tremendously contemptuous attitude they have toward you yeah. and your fa family, okay? If you don't do that, every other company is looking at this and they will treat you exactly the same way. And I wanna say, folks, 
it, you know, if a company was doing business with the Nazis, I'm convinced that the Dodgers and Target and Disney and many, many, many other companies would gladly do business with the Nazis if they could make a buck and get away with it. And they did. And they did. And they are now doing that. In other words, they have no values. This is really basic. I mean, if somebody shows profound contempt yeah, yeah. for you and for your family right. and for America, it's America. It's not just us, it's America. You have to let them know, I'm sorry, but you know, you're fired. You're no longer going to get a chance because it's not like you've been so wonderful in the past, but you've crossed the line. And unless the church, I mean, listen, let, let's, let's think back to the civil rights era, okay? That, that came out of the churches, okay? And some of you know the story of Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott, okay? Something evil was done. Something evil was being done. And the blacks in that part of the world said, you know what we're going to do? Because what you're doing is so foul, mm -hmm. we will no longer ride your buses, now, you, you want to talk about paying a price? <laughs> they walked to work That's right. for one year. They didn't say, well, a week is enough. A month is enough. For a year, they, most of them walked or found another way. They refused to ride the buses because the bus companies and that uh, municipality was evil and they said we are going to take a stand and and it's gonna cost us something we're gonna have to walk we're gonna have to make sacrifices but the Lord is with us we're doing the right thing I love it and I want to tell you something folks love it. Love it. what they did now if you can't make the sacrifice of not shopping in these places or not going to the if you can't make that sacrifice you're participating in this nation going to hell. Yeah, I, want, I want to be clear. If, in other words, if you can't make, if we are so fat and lazy that we can't make that kind of sacrifice, there are people around the world dying for their faith. While we're talking here, there are people being tortured right. for their faith now, right now, right now, all around the world. But Americans act like, well, we're, we, we're past that. We, we can just have a nice time and we go to church on Sunday you're not living out your faith. You have to live out your faith in every, every sphere. And, and if we would do that, folks, it would change the world. American church, now you have to wake up. Now you must live out your faith. And I will let things get ugly to help you understand that this is where things go when the church is silent. When the church is silent. Say, we will not be silent. Church... You know, I think what a lot of us are finding out is the difference between conviction and convenience. Like, like you just heard Eric Metaxas just share. You know, there are people, brothers and sisters, that you will see in heaven one day that are paying a price that's so brutal, so beyond our imaginations. And it's horrible. Whether it be China or third world countries or Muslim countries, they're being in prison. Just, I mean, I have, a, I have a friend, Joe, Joe Hernandez, and we ordained him and we prayed for him and he went over to Dubai to start a church. He could start it as a church because you're not allowed to preach Jesus to Muslims. But so we came up with a name, it's called, uh, what is it called? Uh, he called it the, the Dream Something, the Dream Center, I think. Something like that, not the Dream Center, but something like that. Anyways. And, um, and he opened it up. They have raided him so many times and his family. They have jumped in there. They're looking for opportunities. I just was in, not too long ago, in the last part of November, I was in France, and I was with my, my good friends over many, many years, Pedro and Natalie, um, uh, Nuno and Natalie Pedro. And um, they're Portuguese, but they have one of the biggest churches there in in France, and if you don't know, France is, is, is very socialistic. Very, that's where they say this is where communism actually started. It didn't start in Russia, it started here. And, um, and they, he has been bombed, his cars have been bombed. Uh, the government sits in his service, they want to call him out, they make it so hard, so desperately hard. 
we have no ideas. And that is like, ooh, who doesn't want to go to France? And France is very beautiful, as many of the other countries are. But when it comes to Christianity and the torture that some people are getting and the conviction that they have to stand, and yet we're trying to decide, like, well, you know what? The cabbage is just so better priced at this big box store that's so much closer. We don't even have enough conviction to overcome the spirit of a cabbage. <laughs> just something to think about. But you know, what I'm really sharing with you and the warning is, is it's referred to as white, white, woke ideology. I pray that it would not affect your Christianity. Now the term woke has its pure beginnings back into the 1930s. To stay woke simply meant to pay attention to the social and political issues that impacted racial equality at that time. But since then, that phrase has been hijacked as a rallying cry for identity politics and um, where politicians target minorities and try to separate groups out for political gain posing to be their ally. That's a short definition. Today, you know, um, woke ideology has many, many, um, you have to discern you have to discern not the emotions. You have to discern what's at the root of everything that's being driven here. For example, to be woke or to be in their good side, to not be canceled, to not be talked about, to be embraced by whomever it is you may be thinking about, you must advocate for LGBTQ plus movement by allowing men to be women and women to be men and drag queens to teach your kids in public settings whatever they want to teach them you must be open to sexualization and indoctrination in our public schools upon innocent and naive children that don't know any better you're expected to join the mob and fuel the racial wildfire by defunding the police in those arguments or making sure that you're in agreement that white people are viewed as privileged races and systematically or systemically evil. You're expected to support critical race theory as being right where white children are told to bow their knee in their classrooms and apologize for their own race. And you're supposed to be okay with the subjective emotional usage of pronouns due to gender confusion, at least in that moment, before they change again. And to be okay with the medically and psychological uh, implementation of transgender mutilation and butchery practices, regardless of the future physical, emotional, and reproductive and psychological harm and damage it's going to do to those children that make those decisions before their age of maturity and the list goes on and on and on you know this wokeism is to oppress our children with a, an agenda you know and uh, to it's a slang term for people who who try to get groups to say we're the oppressed and they're the oppressors we're the oppressed and they're there's a it's divisionary you know, but if you dig deeper, go beyond the superficial rhetoric and platitudes that everyone's trying to throw out and force down your throat and demanding and commanding you to accept. And if you don't, you're just a heathen and, you know, and whatever they go down other words. You'll find out that almost everything woke in ide the woke ideology is anti-God, antithetical to the gospel, to the wholeness of the gospel. And it's certainly unredemptive and unbiblical. It's nothing to do with the blood of Jesus. And yet, too many Christians bow their knees for the sake of acceptance, becoming woke in the name of love. In, in, other, in other words, let me give you an idea. We're, we're told that in order to be a, a real Christian, a person of love, you need to love the LGBTQ plus community, we must therefore advocate for their cause. Never mind the truth or that God has made it clear that everything in that community stands for sin. We don't hate, what an old preacher said, we don't hate the sinner, but God does hate sin. 
And don't mix the two. He loved me when I was a sinner. He loved me. But he hated the sin. And the sin was killing me. See, they say, but hey, you know, we're, we're supposed to love them, right? Well, okay, and put everything in, in, in context. In 1 Corinthians 13, normally referred to as the love chapter, it says, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. God loves us right where he finds us, but he loves us too much to leave us there. Here's the situation. A lot of people that say, I want love from you, I demand it from you, they don't want to move from where they're at. At least on this particular. So what's happened? Well, what's ended up happening is the church has adopted, or I should say substituted, the world's definition of love for God's actual true love. And now love is considered to be inclusion and acceptance, regardless. So now, God is the God of inclusion. No, not in whose definition are you talking about. This is where discernment comes into play. See, the American church has been intimidated by the world's culture and its demand that you include them regardless of what they do what they say, or what they believe. So we forsake God's commands and the worship to our God to worship a God, little g, of inclusion instead, even though it's unrighteous, unbiblical, unholy, and sinful. We don't despise people. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not. So the church has oftentimes adopted a half-truth, which is not a half-truth. It's simply a lie. The church just doesn't want to admit it, or they don't have enough discernment to admit it. The truth is Christianity does not exclude anybody. It welcomes everybody, but God loves us right where he finds us. That's his saving power. But he loves us too much to stay in a place that is deteriorating and poisoning and hurting our lives. Christianity is about getting rid of our sin so we can find our freedom. Sin is not defined by you, Mr. and Mrs. Christian. It's not defined by your platitudes or your attitudes or whatever you want to assign yourself to, to befriend other people, to be included by them so you can have, what, a proud badge that you want to wear. I'm not saying it's anyone here in this room. It's not defined by Christians. Love is not defined by Christians. It's defined by God. It's defined by the Bible, and it makes it clear. It does not reject people. It does not reject people. And that's what they'll try to turn on you. They'll say, you're rejected. No, I'm not rejecting you at all. You know, what, uh, what some people really want is to exclude themselves from Christianity by choosing to keep on sinning instead of letting Jesus take away their sin. The church has often just been too unwilling to confront the truth with love. You know, and God asks us to speak the truth in love. Speaking the way I am is not hate speech. Speaking the way I am is not hating any person. Because I was on the other side, maybe in a different area, but I was on the other side. As all of us can attest to, no person is born into this world without the need of a Savior. And it's His unconditional love that saved us. But thank God that freedom is only found when you let Jesus take away our sin. But here's the key. There are things that we can do. It, you know, what I do might not be what you do, but you don't want to lose your voice. And thank God that, uh, that some parents have that, um, that righteous indignation to speak to, in this particular case, um, the Board of Education about the practices that they were doing towards their eight-year-old child without them being made aware of or being informed of because they felt it was their right to teach their children whatever they wanted to teach them until this mother and a bunch of other mothers and fathers showed up and spoke to that Board of Education. 
This is what one mom had to say. Watch this. I'm here to bring awareness to the emails that had surfaced earlier this month. The one I find most disturbing of all is of a third grade teacher trying to talk about sex with eight-year-old students. These are eight-year-old children that she's trying to hold a sexual orientation class with. A parent shared their concern and their um, objection to it and pulled their kid out. And instead of this teacher being concerned of what she did wrong, she goes to a district employee and asks for ways of how she can continue to teach sexual orientation to her third grade class. You guys want us to believe that this isn't a propaganda, that no agenda is being held? This wasn't just any sexuality class. This was specifically designed three days a week she taught LGBTQ curriculum in her class. It raises the question, how many of those students are excelling in that classroom? Is everybody in that class getting A's in math, English, grammar, social studies? That we can dedicate three days a week to teach eight-year-olds about sexual orientation? I don't care what kind of sex is being discussed. The word sexuality, nudity, does not belong in the ears in a classroom of uh, eight-year-old kids. And when a parent showed their concern, what does this teacher do? Completely disregards and goes behind the parent's back trying to find ways of how to continue these lesson plans. The level of disrespect that has been shown to Christian conservative parents is becoming very obvious. It's like all of a sudden, just because we don't fit the agenda, we don't fit in, within the parameters of the agenda that's being pushed, we're being disregarded and pushed to the side. We're not talking about having people excluded. We're talking about the level of uncomfortability that some parents are experiencing, and that's important. Because if you guys want to talk about including all, listening to all, every student matters, our kids matter too. And we don't want those subjects being taught to children who are just eight years old. And the topics get worse and worse, and the subjects get uh, more detailed. And I'm sorry, are we doing Bible studies in classrooms? No, we're not, right? So why is this certain agenda being pushed into the classrooms? But if we don't take a stand and we don't share our voice, they're just going to sweep this under the rug. Why should a parent overhear her eight-year-old kid being taught about sex? That's right. See, that's, that's not at all any kind of hate speech. That's not at all rhetoric that is flamboyant or it is it is protecting one's child it's it's so much more than that so i wanted to to share that with you here's what i believe god's asking from us if i can give you a sign it would be wanted the brave wanted the brave um and i only say that because i'm going to tell you a true story of how life doesn't always go well, but it goes well when you put your trust in God. The sign would be, wanted the brave. In the ninth century, during the 1800s, true story, the Vikings pillaged, torched, and butchered their way through Britain, city after city, kingdom after kingdom, destroying families, destroying faith, and destroying the culture of the day. Until they came to the kingdom of Wessex, the most powerful kingdom of Britain at that time. For seven years, King Alfred of Wessex held back Guthrum, the Viking, and his massive heathen horde that was destroying Britain. But on the 12th night of Christmas in AD 878, King Alfred of Wessex was finally driven together with his family out of this kingdom of Wessex. He barely held on to his own life. He took shelter in a tiny little island in a swamp where he had learned to hunt as a boy with his father. He could have made some kind of strategic move to retreat to the mainland of Europe to find safety and liberty and rescue, but he didn't. He stayed in Wessex, hidden in a secret base on top of the hill in what was once was his kingdom to observe Gotham and the Vikings' army's movements. Little by little, with a small band of warriors that remained, he began to take out their scouts and cut off their supply lines. 
Now, up from that point, the people of Britain thought that King Alfred was dead. They didn't know he was alive. They were living under the heavy yoke of Viking death and tyranny. Again, goods being pillaged and property plundered, women <clears throat> raped and abused, men murdered. Life in Britain had become absolutely unbearable. And then King Alfred sent out a secret message after some time out to the men of the land to see who was still there. And, <clears throat> hold on. Oh, hold on. Everything just went wacko. Mm -hmm. And, Okay, I hate this. Okay, here he goes. Now I like it. <laughs> and um, to gather um, them for one final battle against Guthrum and the Viking horde. Alfred chose the day of Pentecost for, for his battle, five weeks after Easter. And the people couldn't believe it when they heard that Alfred, King Alfred had summoned them. They thought again he was dead and that all hope was gone. But Alfred made his way through the forest. He knew his way around. It was once his kingdom. And he met in a secret meeting place only to discover that there were still 5,000 strong men committed to the cause. That they were overjoyed to see their king again. It's as if he had come back from the dead. And Alfred equipped them over a little bit of time. And he reminded them before they went into battle. He said these words. Men... Be faithful to God, no matter what the outcome is. and God will be faithful to you. He assembled them into a, a shield wall, as the story goes. Interlocking arms and shields in, a, in a, a way with soldiers forming an impenetrable wall. And he led them into battle. Alfred himself locked himself arm to arm with other soldiers. And as they went into the battlefield against Guthrum and his horde of warriors... What by this point had taken the high hill. Now we're going to come down with a mad rush and uh, a flood against his men. Guthrum and the Vikings' horde were so arrogant, believing that they would destroy King Alfred quickly and easily as they had before. But Alfred's men had this one thing going for them. You see, they had nothing to lose and everything to gain. Their children their future, their property. So Alfred's men were somewhat unrelenting and determined. And in that moment, there was a clash of shields and, you know, as the, both walls came against each other, screaming and loud swords hitting one another, absolute bloodbath followed. The Vikings were made up of what's called berserkas, which were drug-induced, and demonically dedicated individuals that had this almost supernatural power. They would literally leap over the, the, the walls of the, that was made by uh, King Alfred and his men. But they were ready with spears and swords and they were impaled. And of course, they didn't go very far. Finally, what the story says, God's providence moved on their behalf. God intervened in some way there was a break just a little bit of a break in the viking shield wall and alfred and his men took advantage of it. they exploited it and they destroyed the vikings on that battlefield and guthrum and his viking leaders escaped they hid in a nearby uh, fortress but they were surrounded by alfred and his men and guthrum had no choice at that point but either to surrender or to starve to death the customary practice of that day, as a story, two story goes, would have been to drag Guthrum out and his leaders in the open for public beheading. But what Alfred did was perhaps the greatest act of mercy and grace in that time frame. He offered to spare Guthrum's life even to grant him a small portion of rulership in part of his kingdom, if he would agree 
to become a Christian, to be water baptized, and if he would agree to the, what's called the Treaty of Wedmore, which would obligate Guthrum to treat all citizens of the kingdom equally, whether Saxon or Scandinavian. Guthrum was so grateful for the sparing of his life. So he agreed and he became a genuine Christian. He was water baptized and he abided by the rules. And um, his Christian name was Ethelson. And he became Alfred's, one of Alfred's greatest as allies for the rest of his life. From that point, Alfred began to rebuild Britain. He rebuilt the schools. He rebuilt the family of faith or the church as you and I would know it. He rebuilt government and order. He assembled a naval force that would rival the Viking, what's called longboats, um, much feared in that day and age. Alfred believed that the Viking scourge that took place was God's wake-up call to his people who had fallen asleep due to spiritual apathy. He believed that the future of his country depended on systematic revival. In other words, continual reviving and not falling asleep at the hand of God. King Alfred's what's called law code was built upon the Ten Commandments, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the Golden Rule, do unto others it would have, it you would have done unto you, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, if we would just follow these, no other rules or laws would ever be needed. That law code ultimately, you probably didn't know this, became the foundation for what is known as the English common law in Britain. Later, it became a foundation in the United States of America for our Bill of Rights and even our Constitution. The whole concept of equal rights under God can be traced back to King Alfred. One historian called Alfred a fierce warrior, a devout Christian, ever thirsting for wisdom, deeply committed to justice, a lover of mercy, and a king who gave himself for his people. He was practically a myth, but a much needed reality. He was, they called him, the king of the white horse, King Alfred the Great. That, my friends, is, is a portrait of the brave. See, Alfred was not someone who was just going to sit back and watch his culture crumble because of Guthrum or of the Vikings. You know, he wasn't sitting back watching Fox News or Tucker Carlson or, you know, waiting for the rapture to come, praying, God, take me out of here before it gets even worse. You know, I just spilled my salad. You know, um, he understood that salvation requires some level of action. And he was born to have and to make a godly influence. The people of faith in Christ, he believed, were not helpless, but powerfully helped and strengthened by God if they would just trust God. And so my friends, that is what God gives you and I, an opportunity where narratives are flying and thoughts are a dime a dozen, unsubstantiated and oftentimes untrue. Where do you stand? Wanted, the brave. Wanted. My closing prayer would be, I imagine, no different for Joshua, right? When he took over the, the great role of Moses. And God says, have I not commanded you, Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you, be strong. He says, be courageous, number two. Number three, he says, do not fear. Number four, do not be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. Let's all stand to our feet. Amen. God is good. I had, I had so much more to give you, but you didn't give me enough time. And time is running out. Um, today, I really want to pray for us, church. I'm appealing 
to you. I'm appealing to whatever. Only you know where your influences are. There's not a person in here that hasn't heard one thing or another. I pray that you would righteously educate yourself. Practically educate yourself. But be the discerning person that Christ has made you to be. Be the influence to your generation that Christ has made you to be. You have a voice and it does count. Thank God that that mother spoke up. Thank God that people, and you know, it's not always going to be in the greatest fanfares of situations. And you don't always have to speak on everything that always happens, but God will give us wisdom. And I keep on telling you that. Use wisdom. But don't bow your knee and certainly don't bow your heart toward anything. And um, God will give you an opportunity. Again, you know, God loves let me refer to myself. God loved me when I was a sinner. But he hated the sin in my life. Because the sin is what was killing me. The sin was, was destroying me emotionally. It was destroying me, certainly spiritually. You would think that. But, you know, I didn't think that way. I didn't know that. To look at things around me in the time when I was being reached and people were trying to tell me about Christ and I was rejecting it faster than a person could even speak it you know to me but I'm here to share with you that so we're not fighting against flesh and blood but at the same time my friends remember we don't exclude people but we do talk speak the truth in love and it doesn't mean that you lose your voice do not lose your voice God gave you a voice for a reason and parents your children have you you are the one who's passing on these truths you are Think about their innocence. You know, I was just looking. My daughter, Natalie, just had her child on Friday. Yay! Amen. <laughs> Hudson has arrived. Amen. And, uh, and she was, uh, you know, just as joyful. Her and Kyoki were just as joyful. And, and we're so happy. And um, Sean and Rachel Willow were there with us. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting. It says, I've been in this rodeo before. I know how long it's going. Anyways, uh, but I was doing me and Pastor Kuna and they were... Finally, that the child came, and, and you think of the innocence of a child, and you know, so dependent on uh, a, a father and a mother or a parent speaking into their life. And for many years beyond that point, that's the way it's going to be. Even though they're going to grade school, they have no idea. But wherever you put them is where is where you authorize them to learn. So we parents, with this. I think God has opened up this kind of dialogue for us to hear these crazy narratives so that you parents would be more aware of what's going on and that you would pluck them out, you know, before they become contaminated. There's no reason why you would keep them in a contaminated environment. You know, I, you know, I think it was Candace Owens who called them indoctrination camps, you know, until they change their ways, which doesn't look like even in the state of Hawaii, my friends, as beautiful as Hawaii is. You know, with the flowing leaves and the beautiful palms and the, the brisk winds and the beautiful skies. You know, our education system has already begun its cruel approach of indoctrinating your children without your consent. You've heard me say that before. And it's important that you pay whatever price you do to protect your child. You do whatever you have. That's your child. You have that authority and um, help them, guide them, lead them, disciple them. You know, as Jude said, you're the one who's gonna pass on these truths, what real love is, what real mercy is, what real grace is, who God really is, what is right, what is wrong, what is up, what is down, what is left, what is right. None of that is known. None of that is known. We used to have the confidence that we could put our children into schools and they learn, like I said before, you know, math and English and, and, and history and you know, and the list goes on of needed, you know, information that is foundational. But that day seems to have withered away. And um, so eyes open, be discerning, be very wise. You honor God, God will honor you. Just honor God. Can I pray for you? I am anyway. So I want you to put your right hand over your heart if you're here by yourself if you're with your spouse and they're with you, please one hand on your heart hold their hand if you don't mind 
Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. A lot has been said in a short amount of time, and I want to thank you for the privilege that you've given me to speak to your people, Father. And Lord, you're dropping seeds and causing those seeds to grow, and I pray there's no greater teacher than the Holy Spirit in our midst today. Father, I stand back and bow down to the greatest teacher to the body of Christ. We need you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. We pray that prayer that Solomon prayed, Lord, give us a hearing heart as parents, as adults, as mothers and fathers, as children, on any level. Give us a hearing heart and understanding mind. Lord, we pray for that discernment. We pray, Lord God, that you would give us wisdom even beyond our years. You called us to live by our faith in you, to trust you with all of our heart, to lean not to our own understanding. Father, many, many here, their understandings have been assaulted and attacked and maybe even violated in one form or another, taken advantage of. Father, we pray right now for healing. We pray, Father God, for strength. We pray right now for just renewing, Lord God, in Jesus' name. We pray that you would cause your healing power to flow through each and every person. Lord, no matter where their sphere of influence, may they see themselves today as a Jeremiah. That they are here, Father, not to be influenced by a world, but to influence the world with righteousness. And though the battles may rage, and though at times there may be setbacks, Lord, give them the courage to stand up. Father, like Alfred, the king of Wessex did, even though he had a setback, you gave him because he trusted in you a comeback. Father God, that helped shape not only Britain, but in part, Father God, American Constitution. Lord, today we pray, we pray for the strength of the church. We pray, Father God, not to be judgmental. Father God, not to be despairing towards flesh and blood. We don't fight against flesh and blood. But Lord, may the, may the banner of righteousness, may these men and women answer the call to be the brave in a generation, to be bold. Father, to walk in that anointing, to walk, Father God, in righteousness, in victory. Father God, an encouragement towards our generation. Lord, today, I bless your people. And I pray that you would bless us as a church, not just Word of Life here, but the church overall. The church overall, Father, regardless of their name, that you would bless the church. That we would not bow, and we would not bend, but that we would stand for righteousness. Give your people the strength, Lord God, that we don't have without you. Give us the strength by the power of the Holy Spirit as we lift up high the name of Jesus without compromise. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Give the Lord a great big hand clap. He's your strength and your redeemer. Amen. Shalom, everyone. High five your neighbor and just tell them, I am the brave. I am the brave. I am the brave. Because you are. God bless you. God bless you. Now go out and let's live brave.